the book of Jeremiah. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 17 in that uh, great, amazing text where uh, Jeremiah contrasts the man who's cursed. The man who is cursed is the man whose heart departs from God because he trusts in man and he doesn't trust in God. And then in verse 7 we see, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. What an amazing contrast, isn't it? The Word of God is amazing, folks. It gives us these fascinating, amazing pictures. And the one picture is a person who trusts God and they're blessed. And another picture of a person who trusts themselves and trusts others. And God says they're cursed. They're cursed. I think there are a lot of people that you know, we feel can feel sorry for because they're trusting in themselves. They're trusting in other um, men and not trusting in the Lord. And today we continue our series in looking at Jeremiah. We're going from trusting in the Lord and hoping in God or our hope is God. Literally, that's what it means there in that second part. We trust in the Lord and our hope is God. And we're going to look yeah. at the soul. And I, I'd like to ask you the question again. How's your soul today? We're back to that. How's your soul today? How's your soul? And, and, and I would pray for two responses from us, including myself. That my soul is well watered today. My soul is well rooted in Christ today. My soul is well watered and well rooted and that's what we're going to be looking at. We've been working through this text, and we started with, and I, I've divided, notice there's a division. I'm going to have to stop these divisions in a little bit. I'm going to run out of space. Um, or actually, I think you can put that up there. But we looked at the first verse of, of trust, and we saw that their soul is in a desert place, in a parched place, because their heart has departed from the Lord. And then we move to trusting in the Lord. And now we're going to look at three messages that all revolve around, I believe, the heart. Because the context is the heart. The heart departing from the Lord. God searching the heart, as we'll see uh, later on in verse 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful, and therefore God searches the heart. So we're concerned about the heart and the soul. Our hearts and our souls. <clears throat> and so, how's your soul today is an important question, isn't it? And the text, uh, again, comes from this text in Jeremiah. I put the whole text up there, but today I'm just going to read verse 7, which we already looked at in a couple of messages, and then uh, the first part of verse 8, and 8 continues, so there'll be three messages in verse 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is God, or is Jehovah. For he shall be like a tree planted by waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for its significance to us. Help us to, by the power of your spirit, truly embrace these truths of being watered and rooted in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this past week, we were up in Elmira, New York, and after I preached last Sunday at, at the church that I was doing the conference in, mm -hmm. uh, the pastor wanted to take me sightseeing. And so about a half hour from the church, there's uh, one of the Finger Lakes. And so we went up to that Finger Lake. But as we were going up, um, uh, he said, hey, I want to show you this waterfalls. And I, I've seen a lot of waterfalls. I mean, we have bush kill around here. We have, you know, yeah, uh, child's play if you want to go a little further mm -hmm. up. And, you know, uh, you have the... Um, uh, uh, Demon's Ferry Falls, so, you know, falls, you know, they're, they're nice kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I said, yeah, you know, let's do it. You know, let's let's go see these falls. And um, and we were chatting, the pastor and I were in the front seat, and we were chatting back and forth and talking back and forth. And all of a sudden, he, he says, hold up a minute. And, and, and he points, and we just turned onto a main street of a, a, a little town. And I look up on this, like, mountain, and there's this full waterfall coming down. It was just like, wow. That town just, I mean, you know, you just come in 
turn turn it on a regular town street and then that town had a whole nother meaning <laughs> because of that waterfall and you can see that all the way down that whatever main street it is mm -hmm. you can see that waterfall isn't that cool wouldn't it be great to live in a place like that you walk out and anytime you're walking along downtown you see this amazing waterfall and it was amazing <clears throat> if you want to go kathy is now on facebook <laughs> she is. it's part of uh it's part of the uh, biblical counseling resources and she put up one of the pictures of the waterfall and us um, by the waterfall and so we're trying to get some information out there and let people know uh, what we're doing what's going on uh, but uh, coming back uh, to this text you know there are two things that people should see in the soul and the life of the Christian who trusts in God the Christian who's blessed because their hope is God there's two things. They should see a life that is watered, watered by the Word of God, watered by truth, watered by a relationship with Jesus Christ, watered because the living, the living water has given us His water and His life. And they should see a Christian who's deeply rooted in the Word and rooted specifically in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What does it look like to be well watered, well rooted? In the context of this, we start with what is the well watered, the well watered soul. Say that a few times fast. Well watered, well watered. Uh, can be a little bit of a tough one. Um, but notice that it starts where it ends from the previous verse. You know, the Spirit of God gives purpose to very specific Hebrew words. And one of the most important Hebrew words is this word, was, be, to be, to become, to abide, to continue. It's the word that we translate, is. And it's the word that speaks of who God is. God says, I am who I am. I always was, I always will be. It means literally to come into existence. And we find that our hope exists in God. Our hope exists in God. Outside of God, where is your hope, folks? Right? And that's what that text means right before in verse 7. The Spirit of God has, and this ver uh, word is not used all that often, but uses it immediately again. And it says, as we see here, for he shall be. By the way, that's just one Hebrew word. <laughs> we got plenty of uh, words there. We got four words in the English language for one word, but it's one Hebrew word. It's the exact same word, is, is. And then like a tree is one word too. So is the tree, is the tree that what? Is well watered. A well watered plant, a well watered tree is a tree that flourishes according to Gil, right? It's a tree that has a flourishing power to it. And so we have this word again of what we are, we are this tree. I like uh, the concept that Gil says is we're no longer a shrub. <laughs> Remember in verse 6? You know, before we knew Jesus Christ, we were a shrub in the desert, in the parched place. Our soul was shriveling up. Now God says in his word, when we trust in God, we're like a tree. And Gil says, like a beautiful green olive tree, like a amazing palm tree like a cedar he just kind of goes on to say we're not a shrub anymore and the tree isn't described and so he gives three descriptions of trees that people would know of in that culture he says those trees have to have water those trees have to have water and they're well watered they're well watered and so we see this this next part of of this idea of a tree that we hope is God. Now the tree, and Proverbs in Solomon says that the fruit of righteousness is a tree of what? Of life. And so what we see there is this analogy of a tree is used of a person. 
when it's saying a tree, it's saying, listen, here's an analogy of a person whose soul does not trust in God. That person is a shrub. And now it says, but the person who trusts in God, whose hope is God, whose hope exists in God, that person is this tree. And it's a tree planted, notice that, and it's planted by water. Now, it's a fascinating thing when you see a tree that doesn't have any water. What happens to it? It dies. It dies. And, and, and if you go to places where there's very little water, you won't find too many trees, will you? You'll find what? Desert and sand. <laughs> and some shrubs. <laughs> but here, we're talking about the beauty of that. And I thought, what, a, what an amazing place to be preaching the sermon with these windows. <laughs> so we talked about, you know, the, the, maybe for the videos and stuff like that, maybe we need to put stuff there. And I'm like, no, we want you to see it out and see the trees. And <laughs> just, you know, I mean, it's part of the beauty of this the sanctuary is 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 looking at those trees and 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 I would say we got some pretty well watered trees around here, don't we? And that's what God wants to say about His church. We're well watered people. We're well watered people. Well, why? Why are we well watered? As we kind of look at this, there's an amazing context here about water. And we find it in Psalm, and then we find it in Jesus' response to the Samaritan woman. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it, it speaks of, blessed is the man, right? In verse 1. And then it says, his delight is what? The law of the Lord. His delight is the Bible, the Word of God. And then it says, he shall be like, there we get it again, there we get this whole idea of a tree planted by rivers of water. It combines the idea of rivers and waters. We'll see the next concept of river in our second point. But Jesus uses the same analogy. He, he uh, meets this woman at the well, right? And he says, give me a drink. And she says, how come you being a Jew are speaking to me? <laughs> or ask me to give you a drink? Because... Jews had no dealing with Samaritans, and let alone Samaritan woman. And she's saying, huh. Now, this was a woman who had had five husbands, and she was living with another man. Five husbands, and she was living with another man. And this Jewish guy, who's, you know, kind of like looked upon as the snob, who won't have any dealings with us, asks her a question, and he says in verse 10, if you knew who was talk, you were talking to you, he would have given you living water. Living water. This is the picture of the tree and the living water. This is the picture of Psalm chapter 1 and verses 1 and 3. This is the picture of Jeremiah verse 8, chapter 17 and verse 8. And Jesus comes to this picture that's well documented in the Old Testament. And he says, hey, listen. You want water? <laughs> right here. It's me. You know, that's true today. You want a well-watered soul? It's Jesus, and it, he's here today. Lo, I am with you, what? Always. Always. I'm here. If you want to be a well-watered soul, look to Jesus today. <clears throat> now, the problem is we're looking at so many other things, aren't we? Am I right? Yes. We get caught up with so many other things that we miss the thing that will bring us and bring our soul to being well watered. And Jesus says, it's pretty simple, folks. It's me. It's me. I will bring your soul out of whatever darkness you're experiencing. And he goes on to say, if you look at it, and let me read it from, from the scriptures here in, in John chapter 4 for you. But in John chapter 4, he goes on uh, to say, Jesus said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. How many of you had some water this past week? <laughs> How many of you got thirsty again? That's his point. It, it, it's not going to satisfy. It doesn't matter how much liquid you drink. We'll go back beyond water because there's water in your coffee too, folks. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> 
you know, that's what you fill it up. You put the coffee grinds in, but you fill it up with what? Water. 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 <laughs> to water. get your coffee. Yep. And, and the thing is, is Jesus is saying, you can drink all the water you want. You're going to need more water because you're going to get thirsty again. And then he says in verse 14, listen to this. This is so essential. Listen to God's word. Listen to Jesus talking to us. He says, but whoever drinks of this water that I give him will never thirst. That's a promise that Jesus has and has given to us. He says, if you drink of the eternal waters that I give, you'll never thirst. Doesn't mean you'll never become physical, th physically thirsty. Because I still get thirsty. <laughs> Me right? too. Yeah. But it means your soul will be well watered. Your soul will be well watered. But the water that I shall give him will become in him. See, it's in us. In him, a fountain of water springing up unto everlasting life. Man, if we're missing that, we're missing what's most important, folks. The reason my soul was thirsty sometimes this week was because my soul was drinking at the wrong well. The reason I was blessed many times this week and my soul was blessed many times this week was because I was drinking at the well of Jesus. And we need to understand what that looks like in our lives. And so we kind of want to wrestle with, you know, what does it look like to, finally, the last verse I put up there, it is to, to be restored in our soul. You know, Psalm 23 says, he leads me beside what? There it is again, the imagery of the, the waters. The water. Being well watered is such an important image. And he says, he leads me beside the still waters. It doesn't mean I walk by and just look. It means I walk in and drink of Jesus in my life. And what happens? It comes right back to the soul. He restores my soul. Notice I don't have a dot, dot, dot there. They're interconnected thoughts from Psalm 23. They're directly interconnected thoughts. The still water and Jesus being the living water results in our soul being restored. What I, I'd like to suggest to all of us that there are many times our soul needs to be restored. Mm -hmm. We know it. But are we drinking from the right well? And so, some application here. What does this well-watered soul look like? What does it look like? Now we have to start, and this is vitally important, we have to start with the Word of God and believe the Word of God and understand that the Word of God is clear about something. You can't be a well-watered soul unless you're saved. Mm -hmm. The Scripture declares that every soul is lost. Every soul is lost. That's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin. He couldn't be born from the line of Adam. He had to be born of a virgin because he's the only one whose soul was not lost. Even John the Baptist, even Moses, even all of them. They were lost souls. That's why Romans says there is none righteous, no not what? No not one. And again, it's very clear in the context, save Jesus Christ. He doesn't fall, as Paul is talking in Romans, under that first Adam. He is the second Adam. Isn't that amazing? Every one of our souls are lost, and our souls, first of all, need to be saved. There are times in the context of the ministry of the Word of God that we just need to bring forth the gospel real clearly. How do you get saved? Philippians chapter 16, Paul responds to the Philippian jailer that says, what must I do to be saved? He says, you must what? Believe on the Lord 
Jesus Christ. To be saved, a lost soul must believe in Jesus. Peter goes on further in Acts to say, There is no other name under heaven by which a man will be saved. No other name. I know that's not popular today, and people will get angry with you when you say that. But listen, the Muslim faith, Catholicism apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jehovah Witness, Mormonism. You say, Pastor, how do you dare name all these things? They don't name salvation as being through Jesus Christ. That's why we must come to Jesus to be saved. Mm -hmm. A lost soul needs to become a saved soul. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So, the well-watered soul looks like, first of all, a saved soul. Now, what happens when you get saved is you become a new creature in Jesus Christ, Paul says. You, you have this new innards. Let me say that again. You get saved, you become born again, you have new innards. Your internal life is changed. Mm -hmm. Your spirit, your soul has been changed. Your heart has been changed. It's been replaced from a stone to a living spiritual heart. Those are all truths that are reflected in the Word of God. <laughs> but that's when the battle starts. <coughs> the enemy knows who are his. Mm -hmm. Just as Jesus knows who are his. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some debate on that, but generally speaking, what I'm trying to say is the devil knows who are his. The devil knows who's lost. But when you get saved, guess what? Mm. You are an enemy. You were an enemy of God. You now are saved by the grace of God. But now, once you're saved, you're an enemy. Mm -hmm. In fact, Scripture makes it very clear. Your neighbor's not your enemy, no matter how bad your neighbor is. Paul says, we don't struggle, in Ephesians 6, we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but what? Against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness. That's our enemy. And the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus says. They are after your soul. They can't take your soul, folks, if you're saved. Mm -hmm. But they're after your soul. They want to send your soul. They want to send my soul back into the desert. Mm -hmm. And that's why a well-watered soul is a sanctified. Sanctified. That means pure soul. A sanctified soul. It also must be satisfied. Satisfied in Christ. Isn't that so important? That I find Christ... His word to meet my soul's needs. And that brings me to my fourth point. We gotta be saturated. <laughs> we gotta be saturated with this water. <laughs> Quite frankly, you can't get enough of Jesus. Mm. We just need him more. More. And more. So a well-watered soul isn't just enough. The Spirit of God then calls Jeremiah to give analogy after analogy after analogy. And we'll get into it in a couple weeks. And then the week after, um, I'm going to be uh, at another conference next week. Pastor Jay will be preaching. I'll be here, uh, but Pastor Jay will be preaching. And then the following two weeks, I'll be fit, uh, doing two messages related to this very text where analogy after analogy of not the heart that departs from God, but the heart that trusts God, whose hope is God. When our hope is God, our soul is impacted. Mm -hmm. And the second piece of this, and then we'll look at a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth piece of this. Second piece is we're well-rooted. Well-rooted. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? No, notice what the text says, which spreads out its roots by the river. What does this mean, to spread out? So, uh, to spread out, or to spread forth, because I'm doing a play on words here, to spread forth 
has the idea, according to Brown, Drivers, Briggs, to send forth, or to send out, or to, Strong's uses these different terms. It, it has the idea of roots cannot become passive. Let me say that again. This is so vital. Roots cannot become passive. What happens when the winter comes in your garden and your roots no longer spread out? Your plants die. Because the winter comes. Before the Christian and for the believer and for the one who trusts God, whose hope is God, whose hope exists in God, That person, we, our roots, our spiritual roots, need to continue to grow, to be sent forth, to spread forth. Vital, key, important part of what it means, as I mentioned before, Gil saying, our soul must flourish. He didn't say our soul, but he's talking about flourishing. He's talking about the heart of the Christian. We must flourish. So how's your root system? How's your root system? Now, I, you know, I live by a river, so I see these roots just kind of growing all the time. They're really frustrating down the beach. And, you know, they just kind of grow everywhere. They're just stretching out. You know, I have a maple tree that just seems like the roots just go on and on and on and on. And, and, and it's an amazing picture of what we see here. Roots that thrive. They're so important in the Christian life. And uh, another commentator uh, points out that one's roots must be rooted in what? Jesus Christ. We see that in, in two really important texts of Scripture. In Ephesians, it says that Christ may dwell in your what? Heart. Okay. Jesus is not going to be physically here for you. You're not going to see him and walk out on the street and say, oh, there is Jesus in his physical body, because his physical body, his physical resurrected body, is at the right hand of God right now. Until he returns, it will be at the right hand of God. But Jesus is God, and therefore he is omnipresent, and his omnipresence is real. And he is literally with you and me. Every day. And that presence is an essential part of the Christian walk and the Christian life. That the problem is, is sometimes we keep him on the outside and not on the inside. And Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you be rooted. There you see that word, rooted and grounded in love. It's this idea of Christ coming in and, and, and the roots start to grow. Colossians uses another analogy similar. It, therefore, uh, as you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him and rooted and built on him. Now, there are another type of root, a type of root that doesn't grow. Jesus speaks of it. Remember that? He speaks of the seed being cast. And some of the seed falls on this kind of ground, and some falls on that kind of ground, and some falls on ground where it's stony, but it kind of grows because there's some soil there. And it says in Matthew, it has no root in himself, but endures for what? A moment, a little while, endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises, what happens to those roots? They die. They don't grow. They don't spread forth. Now, if some of you really like planting, and you enjoy planting, I know, Paul, you do a lot of planting, right? Do, do you have like a, a hot house where you grow your plants at all to begin with? A basement with a great. Right. Have, have you ever, and I'm just talking to all of you, have you ever seen a plant that was started off as a seedling and has grown up but then got forgotten. Have you ever seen its roots? They get all tied up in a knot. You don't want to buy that. 
at Walmart. <laughs> now, there is a way to get around it. You take a knife and you just cut the root so that it will grow again when you put But my point is, it's confined. And in that little space with that little bit of soil, that root will then eventually fill up that space. That's the tribulation. of Fill up that space. And it will have no ability to grow. And that plant... That was in your basement, Amanda. <laughs> that was growing fine. That plant's going to do this. Exactly what it's going to do. And we scratch our heads. And Jesus is talking about those who are unbelievers here. But we scratch our heads sometimes and we say, what happened in our own life? What happened to that plant that was thriving? Guess what? It was rooted where it couldn't spread. And here, the Lord speaks to us through Jeremiah of where we must be rooted. We must be rooted in Christ. And it talks about here, by the river. Did you know that the analogy of the river is also an analogy of God? Did you know that? That God is actually called a river? Turn with me. There's an amazing psalm here in Psalm 65. Turn with me to Psalm 65. And, and, and notice in verse 9, it speaks of God and it says, You visit the earth and water it. There's our what? Well-watered, right? <laughs> Well-watered soul. And it doesn't talk about roots here, but it goes back to this idea of river. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. Now, what river do you know that's not full of water? Oh, there are some. <laughs> There are rivers that have dried up. There's a few. And do you know those rivers that dried up, particularly in different places? Yeah. There's not much vegetation around there, is there? Mm -hmm. The river of God is full of water. That's where our roots need to be planted. You provide their grain, you've prepared it, you water its ridges abundantly, you settle its furs. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. There we see the concept of growth. So important in the Christian life. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths drip with abundance. You have growth. You have abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness. And the little hills rejoice. I always like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the little hills rejoice. Mm -hmm. Not the big mountains, but the little hills that have all that amazing mm -hmm. farms and beauty of it. And, and in, 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 in Zion area, you can just kind of picture the hills mm -hmm. where the, 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 the plants are thriving. And they rejoice. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys are also covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. Now, shouldn't that be our souls? Shouldn't our souls be full of growth because they're rooted in the waters of God? Or by the waters of God, by the river of God? Shouldn't our soul, who's rooted in Christ, demonstrate abundance? Shouldn't we have joy and rejoice in the Lord? Remember the question? How's your soul doing today? Remember the question, right? How is your soul doing today. It's going to be very, very connected to this whole concept there in Psalms. So as we move one step further and as we look at this whole concept of being built and not having roots that are in a place where they can't grow beyond uh, Paul and Amanda's basement, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> but they didn't grow by this amazing waters. Um, remember that we're talking here about the heart. We're talking about your heart. Remember that, that Jeremiah said in verse 5, the one who trusts in man, their heart departs from God. Remember that we're going to be looking at verse 9, that the heart is deceitful. And remember that in verse 10, we're going to be looking at God searching the heart. Because trust and the heart and the soul are interconnected here. And so, I want us to take a look at one other place 
And that's the righteous soul of Lot. The righteous soul of Lot. Now, I, if I read the Old Testament, I don't think Lot is all that righteous. Right? I mean, Abraham said, hey, there's conflict between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. You know, I'll go this way and take my flock this way. You go this way. What did he do? He looked where the water was. <laughs> kind of a smart guy, right? He looked where the water valley was and said, I'll go there. And God sent Abraham to the promised land. Mm -hmm. By the way, that land that was well watered is no longer well watered. You can find that place. It's the place of salt. I believe it's the place directly of salt as a result of the judgment of God upon Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe that literally happened. And that's why you have so much salt there. But Lot looked over at this place and he said, I'm going there. You know what happens when you start going there? You start getting drawn into things there. And Sodom and Gomorrah were there, and he was drawn right into the city eventually. You know who I think drew Lot into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? I think it was his wife. It's not a criticism of our wives. It's a sure criticism of Lot. Mm -hmm. But I'll back my theory up in a moment. Well, God meets Abraham and says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the story? And Abraham said, please not, Lord, don't do that. <laughs> Maybe if there's, you know, so many souls there, right? So many souls there. And, 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 and then, then Abraham thinks about Sodom and Gomorrah and thinks about his visits with Lot and says, well, it's probably not that many. How about this? And he keeps dropping it down. Keeps dropping down the number. You know what? When he gets to 10, you know, Abraham figures, well, hopefully there's 10, right? My nephew, my grand nieces, his wife, you know, the servants, you know, who knows? Guess what? And I forget how many he dropped it down to. I think it was 10, 5 or 10, something like that. There weren't that many in Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends two angels to destroy and deliver. And it wasn't the angels who delivered. It's very clear. It's God who delivered. The angels are ministering saints for the purposes of God. And one of the purposes was for them to do the work of God. So it was God who saved through the angels. Lot's righteous soul. We have it right here in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, in 2 Peter chapter 2, it says that God delivered righteous lot his tormented his tormented righteous soul from day to day so notice his soul was tormented from seeing and hearing their lawless deeds you ever feel like that sometimes I feel like that all i have to do is i do a lot of reading and i read article after article and it's just horrible what's happening in our culture today it's being yeah. torn apart it's ugly it's terrible we live in tough times don't we mm -hmm. Lot lived in tough times. Oh, yeah. You know what happened to his soul? His soul was tormented. So sometimes our soul is just going to feel like, I can't take it anymore, right? But look at what happened. Then the Lord rescued him. The Lord knows how to what? Deliver the godly out of temptation. Now, the story goes on. The angels finally said, we got to go. It's happening. And Lot, his wife, and two daughters fled Sodom and Gomorrah, and the angel said, don't look back. Don't look back. You know, that's how temptation gets us sometimes. We look back. We get trapped back. And somebody got trapped back. Who turned to a pillar of salt? Lot's wife. She turned back. Turn back. I don't know what it was like for Lot, but I know what it's like to lose a wife, and I imagine that was a really difficult time. Mm -hmm. To watch your wife in front of your eyes turn into a pillar of salt because she turned back. The other day, our souls are important to God. Mm -hmm. How's your soul today?
Is it well rooted in Christ? Is it? Because my soul needs to be, your soul needs to be. So we ask the last question as we close. What does a well-rooted soul look like? What is it going to really look like? What is it going to, how is it going to function? What's it going to be? And, and, and the first thing is, I mean, <laughs> as we look at the scriptures that we just kind of went through, we need a strong faith. If you go back to the text up here, <laughs> that Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Faith, being rooted and grounded in love. We need a strong faith, don't we? Do you realize that in the spiritual battle we all face, that if you're doing the right thing, there's a guarantee? Satan will throw a missile at you. I have no idea what the missile will be at you. It's going to be different for each person. But he's not aiming it at your head. He's aiming it at your soul. He's aiming it at your soul. And how do we respond to the fiery missiles that Ephesians 6 speaks of, of the evil one? We put up the shield of what? Faith. Of faith. We need a strong faith today, folks. Oh, yeah. We all do. We need a strong faith. Secondly, oh, I didn't put that up there. Sorry. We need a strong faith. We need a stable walk. A walk that is centered and rooted in Jesus Christ. Not a walk that comes and goes. One of the biggest concerns I have today is, you know, I, I, and quite frankly, I don't, it doesn't matter if you come and go from this church. I really believe that. I really believe that. Believe me, I want you to stay. <laughs> I'm not encouraging you to go. But there are many reasons why God sends people out and keeps people in. And, you know, and, and this church is just a local church. I don't know where. But you surely and I surely need to stay in church. Amen? Amen. 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 Where the word of God is preached, where the fellowship of believers are, that's why we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. We need a stable faith. Yes. And I'm watching our millennials get carried away, who were strong seemingly of faith when they're young, get carried away like mm -hmm. the wind. We need to bring them back. And I thank Pastor JJ for doing the ministry to millennials. It really is working on, hey, this is important. And it's not our church that is important. Have I made that clear? Mm -hmm. Whether you come and go, out, but it is the church. It is the church of Jesus Christ that is important. We need to be faithful. And that stability comes not in a church. It comes in Christ. In Christ. Thirdly, <laughs> we're going to need a state of joy, folks. Amen. You know? That Psalm 65 where the river of God is full of water, <laughs> that brings joy. That brings rejoicing. The psalmist there isn't talking just about the hills. That's an analogy, and it's an analogy of the soul. Mm -hmm. Yes, it starts with talking about Zion, but it moves right down to, again, in verse 4, blessed is the man. So we see that consistently throughout the scripture. And you know what? When my joy isn't there, my soul dries up. Soul must rejoice.